You're listening to Feathers, a podcast of stories of women walking in faith. I hope these stories inspire you and encourage you to take flight in your own faith. I'm your host, Amy Bennett, and this is Season 8, Episode 4. Feathers is an outreach of Abiding Ministries. Find more encouragement at abidingministries.net. Well, hey, friend, and welcome to Feathers this week. Um, A few weeks ago, we had Beth Forbes with Sarah's Laughter on the podcast. Um, She was recommended by one of our listeners, Christy Newman. Hello, Christy, if you're listening. Um, Well, today, our guest is another of Christy's friends, and her name is Casey Enriquez. Casey has an incredible testimony of overcoming trauma, addiction, and homelessness through Christ alone, and now runs a ministry called Beauty from Ashes. Um, As you will hear, she certainly has a Beauty from Ashes story and now works tirelessly to help other women find the same thing through a ministry. So I want you to hang on to the end of this episode because we have a special challenge I want to share with you guys. Um, but first, let's get to the conversation with Casey. Well, hey, Casey, and welcome to Feathers Today. Hi, how are you? Oh, I'm so good, and I'm so glad that you're with us today. Uh, how about we start off, you can introduce yourself, introduce your family, and what keeps you busy these days? Okay, um, my name is Casey, and I am a mother of four and a wife to my husband, Aaron. Um, we met actually 20 years ago this February. We've been together. Um, my oldest, her name is Shelby, and she's 19. And then I have a 17-year-old son, Aaron Jr. Then I have a 15-year-old daughter, Haley, and a 7-year-old who is my second chance child, and his name is Noah. And they keep me busy. I'm actually a stay-at-home mom. I homeschooled the first two, and um, the other two are in public schools. And my husband actually is just coming out of a um, health battle that um, I have basically been his by his side and being his nurse. And so those are the things that keep me busy, including um, the Beauty for Ashes ministry that he and I both run together. So that's yes. what... That keeps absolutely <laughs> keeps you busy. It's always yes, amazing yeah. to me as um, people share. It's just all the different things that they have their hands into. And um, we definitely we definitely stay busy, but that's good. God has work for us to do. That's right. That's um, right. Well, I'm excited because our mutual friend, Christy, recommended, um, recommended you to be on the podcast. And um, just really excited to hear more about your story. And as you mentioned, the Beauty for Ashes ministry that you run. So um, I'm going to actually jump right into it because I'm excited to talk about it. But um, I would love for you to just really, um, I don't know if it goes all the way back to your childhood. I mean, we don't have to go through all the details. But um, so you went through some rough stuff, right? Um, Right. And then came to Christ. So walk us back. Where did it all start for you? Well, in a nutshell, um, Satan just didn't want me here. My uh, biological father... um, wanted me aborted Uh, my mom fought for me to not be and I praise God for that Um, I came from a divorced home but God blessed me with an amazing um, father figure who adopted me and um, I grew up in a home with three siblings and um, I watched my older brother walk through addiction Um, unfortunately in my childhood I um went through sexual abuse starting at the age of two. And it wasn't just some one person. I was abused over the years um, by many different men that were in my life, whether by babysitters, next door neighbors, um, stuff like that. It all kind of culminated and came to a head when I was 13. Um, I had been running with the wrong crowd and found myself in a park and ended up being raped at knife point. Um, and my life just really kind of went downhill from there. I would always say, I would say I was always a troubled child, but I think that was really the icing that put, you know, the, the cherry on top of the cake or whatever, however you'd say it. Um, I got put into mental hospitals and girls' homes and stuff like that because my family just could not understand um, how to deal with me because obviously my life had gotten out of control. I, um, just went and found myself in this girl's home in the middle of nowhere 
in New Boston, Texas. And my parents dropped me off at this place in the middle of nowhere. And I remember holding on to my dad's leg and begging him that I would change. I would be better. I would be good if he wouldn't leave me there. And they left me there. Um, but I met Jesus there for the first time. And tell me this, again what age this is. At 13. At 13. And this is like a, is like a foster home? Is that, or it was somewhere? It was, it was basically a farm for wayward girls. And it was called the Holy Highway. Um, and I was surrounded with about 30 other girls that were in my age range or up to the age of 18. And we had women that were there that lived in dorms with us and we had to do chores and they put us on a schedule and we went to school and, you know, um, but one thing that was implemented 24 seven was the Lord and his word. Like I would have to remember not verses of the Bible, but chapters of the Bible. I did not really want Jesus then. I wanted to go home, and I played that game. I memorized. I used my um, book smarts to get me through, and I ended up graduating nine months later, and I got to go home. So tell me real quick, let me interject again. Is your home, are they believers at all Um, at that time? At this time, I think what I had gone through had driven them to seek out Christ. And I think the way that they knew how to seek out Christ was through church um, and, and something called Walk to Emmaus. They were very involved in. I don't know at that point what their beliefs were. I did know that my mom was praying scripture over me, and I do know that they were reaching out to the Lord. I just don't know at what extent that was but i do know that they were leaning on him through that so time. when you went to so when you went to this home the idea of jesus and faith was not like a brand new thing i guess no. that's what i was getting at no it wasn't a brand new thing but it was more like a church thing what the difference between the girls home that i was in and then going home to where my parents lived is that i never heard jesus's name in church i thought that if i went to church i was a christian gotcha. if that makes any sense and i that's how my parents um i think were being taught because of the church that they were going to um and i was able to live at home for about a year or so and then the man that raped me got out of jail and found me and started stalking me and so my parents sent me to live with an aunt that i didn't know in georgia and she um kind of used the lord against me she would say that god would tell her um, in her dreams that I was sneaking out at night. And at this point I was, and I was looking at this as a fresh start. I really was being a good kid. And anyway, she ended up kicking me out and I'm in Georgia in the middle of nowhere. And that's kind of where my homeless life began. And I ended up getting through high school. 14, 14 or 15. I was 15 at this time. Oh my so, goodness. And so you're just, you're just out in the streets. You don't get to go home. No, you're not with your I, aunt. Nope. I was in the middle of nowhere. I bathed in gas stations. I stayed in crack houses. I ate out of trash cans. I mean, I did what I could to survive. Um, And then I had another aunt who is my very special aunt who said I could come live with her in Oklahoma. And at that time, she just wanted to bring me home to my mom because, of course, my mom was upset with where my life was at. And so I accepted to go live in Oklahoma to, with my aunt that was very close to me. And she brought me home for Thanksgiving and she kind of dropped a bomb on me and my mother that she was leaving me there. Well, this is the same small town that this guy that raped me still lived in and I was not willing to. And at this point, I was 17 years old. Um, I have a big sister who said, hey, she can come live in Austin with me. And so at that point, my parents got me my own apartment. I got two jobs and basically two weeks into living in Austin, I met my husband and I would say that's when dynamite exploded because we were two very broken people who were meant to be together, but God had his hands on us for us to be alive. That is when my drug addiction began. I was addicted to cocaine and heroin for 10 years. Um, he was a severe alcoholic. 
We were physically abusive to each other. We bore three kids out of this relationship that they lived in it. We lived without electricity. My kids lived without food. Um, you know, they saw a lot of things they should not have seen. And one day after being high for a week straight, um, we just looked at each other with just kind of like, it was a cold deadness both of us had. And we were sobbing. And we had both grown up, been told about, we had both known about this Jesus. And it was at that point that we knew if something didn't give, we were going to die. And so we got down on our floor together sobbing and we just cried and said, if you're real, then you need to come save us. And it wasn't an overnight thing. We found a church and we just started walking it out the best that we could. But God really had his hand on us. I mean, he used what I had learned at that girl's home, those seeds that were planted, he started to grow them. So it wasn't like I really started off as a baby. I did, but I grew really fast. And in essence, it helped my husband grow and trust. And he got baptized and he got to baptize our children. And, um, yeah, that was about eight years ago. Oh my goodness. So this is after 10 years of addiction. Yes. And just spiraling down. And both of us have similar childhoods. So if you can imagine the the pain and the aching and just the, we didn't, we both wanted to die. It was a very self-destructive lifestyle. And that absolutely is, you know, the case for a lot of people with addictions. Is that how, it, that's how it ends um, mm-hmm. with death. That's, it's amazing that the both of you with your kids are all, you know, together at this point and. Wow, God really inter- it sounds like God really intervened in that moment. Um, well, I'm just I'm just trying to think about what is that like? You you're sobbing, you cry out to God, and you get up and you what is that? You just kind of look around and say, I mean, do, where, do, where do you, are you? <laughs> like, do you feel a change at that point, or are you just kind of like, well, <laughs> we we didn't immediately feel a change it wasn't that you know you hear about there are people that experience those instant miracles and that's not the case um we this is a very slow transition i think two days after that happened his mom invited us to church and so we just kind of started going slowly now keep in mind we hadn't abandoned our old life fully because we hadn't become christians but what we had done is we did cry out to God. He did listen and he did hear us. And I think because he knows us so intimately, he knew how to handle Aaron and I. We have things that run so deep that need immense healing that we could not have been true believers if it would have been an instant, instantaneous conversion. We needed to see his hand move in mighty, mighty ways, like the removal of the addiction, the going through the withdrawal process, the watching him pay our bills when we had nothing, my husband making it through school and having a full-time job, all of these things, it, it came in a very long walk, um, but it was at his urging, and we would fall back, and then he would get us back up, and we would fall back, and, mm-hmm. you know, throughout this time, People would always tell us, and, and, you know, I had always been told as a kid, you know, you were meant to do something. And I think the last words that the um, lady that ran the girls' home told me, she said, you will do mighty things for Jesus. You think you don't now, but you will. And I don't know why that stuck with me. I didn't believe it. I didn't want it, but it stuck with me. And, And my husband, he's been told similar things and just when you look at what we've been through and how we lived to know that we're alive god had his hand on us he had to have for sure we should be dead we should be dead people that are addicts sexually abused addicts people that are felons as both of us are we are not the statistical outcome we are miracles and products of christ Mm mm-hmm Absolutely. 
So I'm wondering, so as you're walking through this process, I mean, I imagine that you have the physical addiction to deal with. Yes. And then you have the underlying things that probably cause the addiction. So I'm just thinking practical things here. What helped you guys through first the physical addiction? Did you guys have, did you go to a medical facility? We did both did. Yes, we both did um, at different times because we needed to, one of us needed to be home with our children. Um, we both did do treatment centers just to get through the withdrawals. Um, cocaine is not <clears throat> cocaine is the type of drug that if you can just sleep it off and, and get away from the circumstances of it, like we lived across the street from our drug dealer. So obviously we needed to move. Um, we needed to want to change that situation, but with heroin, it was a whole different story because there was that physical withdrawal. So we both at different times, um, did, um, treatment and then we met doctors who put us on and what's called a maintenance program and through the course of a year or two we did the maintenance program and you know you wean yourself off of it but it's it's a commitment it is a choice to get well and then dealing with the underlying problems that caused the addiction in the first place and to be honest with you we still walk through that the having to deal with our past, the emotional traumas that have been brought up and, you know, that's a lifelong, I think that's for all of us, right? We all have, we all have things. I'm personally, I mean, in counseling because I'm, you know, just dealing with stuff. I mean, I think it's, that's, I think that's walking out your salvation and I think that's, you know, dying to your flesh and just, just doing that. Is there anything though particular that has helped as you deal with the emotional, spiritual side of the healing yeah i have got a great very small but very special group of women that love me and that pray with me and that when they see me withdrawn and because i'm one of those people that when i'm going through a hard time i just kind of shut the door to everybody and uh I have three just really good friends, Christy being one of them, my best friend, Michelle, and then my other best friend, Tara, that just will pull it out of me. And then above that, I have Christ and I have my husband. And because I am married to a fellow addict, which they tell you is the worst thing to be, but it actually has been beneficial to us because we can feed off of each other. I can come to him and say, I'm struggling today. This is how I feel and, and, and vice versa. And we can pray over it together and we can cry over it together and we can seek out the Lord together. And it's really a perfect match because we know, we know the feelings and the struggles of being an addict and that it's, it's heartbreaking because a lot of people think addiction is a, is a choice. And yes, that first time to use that drug is a choice. Absolutely is. But Satan has taken drugs, and he is ripping people's lives apart through it. And then unless you have walked through it, it's an indescribable despair that, it, I mean, you, you can't explain it. So I'm just wondering, um, as somebody who's been homeless, addicted, um, in a lot of pain, has experienced a lot of trauma, What's maybe one thing that you would like people to know about people who have been in addictions and homeless that that you think is a perhaps misconception? That we're not throwaways. We we were created by God like everybody else. And everybody that is homeless and addicted has a story. There is a reason behind they are who they are. They've chosen what they've chosen. And it could be somebody that just comes from a divorced home or it could be sexual trauma. It could be anything. We don't know what you deal with going through being a child and growing up. And, you know, some of us are prone to just pick up that vice and some of us aren't. And um, I just, you know, when we are in our ministry and we are with these women and these children, I just see the same thing that I think a lot of people overlook. You see them on the side of the road holding up 
their uh, signs and you think, I don't want to give them money because they're just going to go get drunk. And yeah, most likely, but, and until you've slept in the weather on a concrete bed without protection or, or covering, you can't really judge, you know, if God tells you to give, then give and don't worry about what happens when it comes out of your hands. It's, it's, it's going to happen. Yes, they're probably going to drink or do drugs, but they are also probably going to eat or go feed their families or go use that last bit of money to ride the bus. But remember in everything that the Bible says that the son of man had nowhere to lay his head. He didn't have a place to call home. And these people have souls and they need love. And, and they have families and they have tremendous stories. And that's just, if I could just leave, you know, anybody with a thought when you see an addicted or a homeless person, they are very much feeling the pain and they, they are absolutely aware of their situation. And, you know, next time you see somebody, just pray and ask God, what should I do? You know? Yeah, I was definitely convicted about that several years ago that um, if I felt led to get, I would just give it after it left my hands. It's out of my, you know, it's it's out of my responsibility. I, you know, right. I don't have to uh, I don't have to be responsible for what happens. It's up to them and God, you know, right. what, what right. happens. And if they and if they use it incorrectly, then that's that's OK. Right. It's OK. And I just I don't know. I just feel like we're we're called to give. And I totally agree with that. Um, I, before I want, I do want to talk to your ministry. I'm glad you um, talked about that. I want to talk about how that really started for you guys. But I want to also ask you for people listening and even myself that have family members that are just are still in the throes of addiction. Mm-hmm. Do you feel like there's anything that we can do to help? I mean, clearly you had family members trying to help you, right? Um, and I'm sure along the way you had people try, trying to help, um, but it really, of course, was you guys making a decision within yourselves to make that change. But do you think that there's something that people can do to help? Yeah, and I know it's going to sound cliche, but I believe in the power of prayer. I believe in the power of intercessory prayer. I absolutely do, because... <clears throat> if people wouldn't have been praying for me throughout my life, I'm not really sure where I would be. I know ultimately it is up to God and to, for me to choose him, but um, prayer and just like the not leaving them because there is a fine line of putting your foot down and not being taken advantage of because an addict will take advantage of you. They will lie to you and they will steal from you because that's what their addiction is, is, making them do but at the same time there is love and grace and and you can speak i know that my family and a lot of my friends prayed scripture over my life it wasn't just a dear lord please get them out of that addiction no it was speaking you know jeremiah twenty nine eleven over our lives like god you created them for a purpose and you have a hope and a plan for their future like reminding God of his promises. His word says he's looking for somebody to remind him of what his word says. He wants us to come with expectation. And so I just encourage anybody that loves an addict or has an addict in their family that they're not lost. Satan might have a grip on them, but Satan's been defeated in in the power of God's word and utilizing that in prayer is so absolutely important when dealing with an addict and just letting them know like I love you I'm not going to help you kill yourself but I love you yeah and that's what it feels like sometimes is that you're actually helping them kill themselves and yeah. that's really frustrating it is it it is from the fan I can't I can't speak from the family's point of view because I was the addict but I do know um that yeah the families are are the victims in an addict's wake the y'all are the ones left to pick up the pieces and y'all are the ones up at night and y'all are the ones crying we're not crying the addicts aren't hurting they're high you know their pain they're escaping from their right pain yeah but but y'all don't get to and so like i mean the prayer is not just for um their part but also for you for that you to trust the lord 
and and also let healing be a part of your walk in their addiction too so it doesn't destroy you too addiction can destroy not just the addict but the people that love them Mm -hmm. that's so true um goodness goodness i'm so thankful god really truly has done a miracle in in you and your husband's life and i'm just so grateful to be talking to you today um so i do want to transition here i want to so you've moved from being an addict um, walking okay. with the Lord now, and you actually have a ministry called Beauty for Ashes. So tell me how that started and what you guys do. Well, <clears throat> that started um, when we first got serious about Christ about seven years ago. He told us to just go start giving tacos to the homeless people. So that's what we did. We would just go downtown to our old stomping grounds, places we had lived or been at, and we would just give them tacos and, and ask you know, can we pray for you or you have any prayer requests? And we did that for a good three years. And when we um, got involved in our church, the Lord told me this needs to grow. It, it doesn't need to be a street ministry. You need to start focusing less on the food and more on taking me to these people because the food is not going to save them. Like, it's an opening tool that you can use, but in the end, they need me. And we would see that because we would, you know, we would hand out little the little New Testament Bibles. And, you know, one of the women we had had the opportunity to pray with ended up getting hit by a car. And one of our Bibles was found in her uh, stuff. Mm. Um, And we've had a lot of people die. And it really was an eye-opening experience because... God wanted us to stop with the blankets and the socks and the blessing bags and, and and to really focus on taking the gospel to these people. And I was like, well, Lord, we don't have a building. <laughs> like, I mean, we and it, and the servants are few because when you say, let's go feed the homeless or we're going to go out to the homeless, fear is. And, and I understand why people feel that way there is a misconception going in that you're putting yourself into a dangerous situation but the lord says he goes before us and he is behind us and if he's called us to do it he equips us to do it and so therefore we just went into it like that um and it literally started with me my husband our kids and my best friend and he opened the doors to the salvation army and it has just Steamrolled. I mean, the Lord is just opening doors. And what we do is we go have church with them. We literally go and we praise and worship. We break bread with them. Um, we deliver a message. And this year for 2018, he's called us to start going twice. We were only going once because these people, homeless people, um, they need to build trust. You have to show them you're not there for yourself you have to show them that you're not there for a pat on the back or I did something good. They want to know that they are really loved and that you're really willing to invest in who they are. And so um, with the Salvation Army for the past two years, we have been going, we had been going once a month, the last Saturday of every month. And we will take breakfast and we would have service. And, you know, in this last year, the Lord has just been saying to me, like, it's time to grow. It's time to you know, expand your tents and, and, and move forward. And it's a scary thought because we get attacked. Satan just comes for us every single time. It's time to go out. Um, somebody gets sick or some catastrophe happens. You know, we've been in wrecks. We've been, I mean, it's just the things that Satan tries to throw in our way to keep us from going is insane, but you know, God is there and, and we go and, now we go twice a month and um, what really kind of put the yes to are we supposed to go more was at our Thanksgiving service, one of the women got saved um, or I should say accepted Christ and, and baptized. And so that was really kind of, I feel like God saying, I am telling you to move forward, move forward. And all we do is we go And we love them like Jesus loved us. We give them companionship. We pray with them. We worship with them. We study the word with them. 
um, we disciple them. It and it, I, I keep in contact with them. I just talked to one of the ladies last night. Um, I, I give out my personal information. They have access to me at all times um, for prayer requests and you know just if if you're having a hard day or you know we've we've given them rides to job interviews and we've you know just been the hands and feet of Jesus. We're doing what we're called to do. You know, had people not done that for me when I was in my time of need, then I don't know where I'd be. Yeah, and I can ju- I just can't help but think just how much compassion you must have just because you've been there. Yeah. I mean, that's just, I mean, I think we're all called to compassion. God can give us compassion. But I just think sometimes when we go through something, you know, when we turn around and help somebody that's been in those same shoes, there's just something special and different about that. It is. It is. And when you walk into, you know, the Salvation Army isn't like this. We all have these homes that we live in that feel comfortable and homey. And you walk into the Salvation Army and its walls are gray and it's kind of like a jail facility. And then you see these babies and these children and these teenagers and they're coming into a service and you're just like, your heart breaks because those are God's children too. And their moms are... You know, we've had women coming in off the street from finishing prostitution and walking right into a service. We've had to protect women from their pimps. You know, I mean, it is that lifestyle, but that's where Jesus went. He went in to the sick and and, and the dying and, and the cold, and, and he said, I want that one, and he reached out for them. We're, we're not. We're not doing the gospel justice sitting in churches and homes, and all of that is great, and and I love my fellowship with my church family and and my time with my women on Wednesday nights, but man, we have been told to take the gospel to the nations, and you can do that on a daily basis. It is not just for people overseas. We've got people dying in our own backyards, you know, and... It is hard to go down there. I'm not saying it's easy. There's been times where I've woken up and wanted to cancel that day. But, you know, I mean, God didn't cancel on me. And I just want to make sure that I follow Christ's example to the best of my ability because I spent 30 years not following his example. You know? Mm-hmm. Oh, my goodness. So good. Um all right, Casey. So I have just enjoyed this so much, and oh my goodness, um, I am just feeling so grateful just for you, and um, that God just saw it fit to um, just have His hand over your life and and all the work that you're doing. And um, so, if people want to get involved with your ministry to help. Tell about tell us about where you are and how people can get involved and in, in, in contact with you. Well, we are um, based the Salvation Army in Austin, Texas, and it's called Beauty for Ashes, and we have a, a Facebook page. We're working on a website. We are, we're still not 501c3 yet. We're praying for God to pull all of that through so we can become nonprofit and get all of that in the networks, but, you know, if anybody feels led to help, um, they can definitely get my email address through you and my um, phone number. I am willing and open. We need servants to go with us that know the Lord. We um, always update what's needed on Facebook, like supplies as far as food and Bibles and notebooks and pens and pencils. We take um, what are called feminine bags. They're brown bags because the need of a woman on the street is feminine hygiene products. They don't have access to them. And sometimes it's between the choice of food or feminine products. Um, But, you know, we need prayer warriors, we need servants, and um, they can get in contact with me through email, through my phone number, um, through the Facebook page that we have. It is called Beauty for Ashes. And, um, yeah, I mean, if God tells, tells somebody that, that they should come, you know, we're willing to just absolutely embrace them with open arms. We need all of the help that we can get. Well, um 
I will definitely link the Facebook page in your email on the show notes of this. Um, it'll be okay. on our website, abidingministries.net. And I would mm-hmm. just love, I don't know if you're interested, I've just had this idea. Maybe if you did like an Amazon wish list, I would love the listeners to come alongside you guys and get some of these. I mean, it just seems so simple, pens and pencils and paper and the feminine products, and we just get it shipped right to you. Would you guys be interested in doing that? That would be amazing. We would love that. Yes. We would I will I will definitely get started on the Amazon wish list. Yes, I would love to and link that and I'll I'll be putting that I'll share that when this comes out. I'll share that and um just give people some tangible ways to help you guys out. Yes, ma'am. That would be great. That would okay. be great. I'm so thankful that we've been able to talk. Yes. This is amazing. Yes. Thank you so much, Casey. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my goodness, guys. Are you so pumped? to help Casey and her ministry out. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I was just so moved by our conversation and moved by the work that she is doing after all that she has been through. And I just really want us to come together and help her out. She has, in fact, created an Amazon wish list, and it has everything Every price point that you can think of um, it has everything from crayons to Bibles to razors to highlighters to paper plates. I mean, just about anything. Um, they have a wish list, um, any price point, like I said, and help as much as you can. This is the first time Feathers has done something like this that I can think of um, where we're really helping a ministry out. I just really feel led that we can come alongside her and do that. So um, go to abidingministries.net slash blog. Um, You'll see, you should see her post um, up there with the link on the Amazon wish list. And when you buy it, it goes straight to them. So um, do that. Let's let's just rally together and be the hands and feet of Jesus to help these people that she is getting face to face with. Um, you know, not all of us can get out there or, you know, are gifted to get out there face to face with people, but we can help in this way. And I just hope that we do that. Um, and I just want to tell you guys, Casey was so sweet after we stopped our conversation. And, um, you know, I think I, I mentioned that we have a family member that's just really struggling with addiction and she prayed for us and um, gave advice and she is just so, um, legit. She has such a, um, warm, caring heart has emailed me several times, even since then saying she's praying. And I'm just so thankful for Casey and and would be happy to, um, give back to her. I know I'm going to, and I hope you come alongside as well and do that. Um, two other things that I just, I just wanted us to remember as we go, um, away from this conversation is one is that all of our healing begins with surrender. Um, As they are walking this difficult path, you you know, they had to get to the point where they just surrendered, said, not my way anymore, but yours, Lord. And no, it wasn't perfect after that, but that was the beginning point of all of their change. Um, And the second thing that I take from Casey is that discomfort and fear shouldn't stop us from loving others and doing what he asks. So it is, um, as she says, sometimes it can be a little scary at first, discomfortable, um, or uncomfortable, I should say, and um, yet they do it anyway. And that's how God calls us to uh, love others. And I just love that, um, you know, her encouragement that she does that and it's making a difference. So I'm just so inspired by Casey and her and her story and her journey that she's been through. And I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, As always, I want to remind you that you can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Abiding Ministries. And also you can sign up for emails um, at AbidingMinistries.net as well. Um, All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. Always appreciate you being here and we'll see you next week on Feathers.